So Peter, yeah, you started racing MGs, I think, in the in the. Oh, well, actually, you had a sports racer too in the in the fifties and then into the sixties. Well, the thing is, I I really started uh, getting into the whole sports car thing just at the time it was really becoming a sort of an in thing in the fifties. You know, I was in the eighth grade and uh, I had a next door neighbor that had an MGTC that he raced and I started going to the races with him. But the neat thing about it was that he worked at a shop down in Sausalito where I was living. And uh, so I, you know, just volunteered to go down there and sweep floors and wipe up tools and just to hang around to see what these guys were doing. And of course they were all, you know, in their twenties and stuff. And uh, so I got to see how race cars were built and the guys that raced them. I never did all the rest of the kid things, that, you know, after school sports and stuff, because I could ride my bicycle over to the shop and, and uh, it's like almost know. like daycare, but a little yeah. bit. Yeah, <laughs> it was so much fun. And I just, I just, those days were so important to me. And I, you know, I, you know, kids ask, you know, what am I going to do or whatever? I said, you know, go see if you can get a job someplace. And it's so difficult now because people are so worried on the liability of, you know, if a kid comes in there and gets hurt or something. And we didn't have those problems, you know, and that's the thing that there's so little opportunity for people to sort of, you know, uh, come in and, and learn firsthand. Just, you know, if it's nothing more than just watch. All right, so in the mid-50s, you got out of high school, you'd been playing around with cars. Yeah. You'd started racing at that point. I wasn't well, no, racing you couldn't, myself. No, you couldn't race till no, you were 21, you had to be back, 21 then. Yeah, yeah. back in the day. You know, and I'm, so you, uh, you know, I'm a 16-year-old kid at yeah. that point. I've got a long way to go, <laughs> but I'm hanging out with all the guys that are going racing and learning about it. And that, to me, is just as interesting as being a driver, and that's what I wanted to do in being around it. But, you know, the thing that I learned in going around with all these guys is that racing costs a lot of money. Yeah. And these guys aren't really making a lot of money. You better have another type of job that uh, will maybe pay for your racing. So you so, went to design school So I went then. to design school and, you know, people actually made money designing cars. I mean, That's how, crazy. how cool could it be? <laughs> so uh, I went down there on Easter vacation. Uh, I drove down there, you know, and, uh, and I walked in the in the back door with the students in the morning, you know, and just went in and went and sat down in a class and listened to what was going on. And you know, within an hour I knew this is where this, I really wanted it, to that be. That was it you for know. you, huh? Absolutely. I, I had gotten to know a, a couple of people in Detroit who came out looking for the top end students, you know, in their eighth semester. And I was only into fourth going into fifth semester. And uh, so I called back east and, and uh, I had an airplane ticket the next day and they flew me back and they reviewed me and said, okay, you've got six months to make it. And so how I, old are you at this point? 19. 19. Yeah. And going to GM. Going to GM. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it was, you couldn't have gone to a better college in the world because you got the best designers, the best, you know, corporate leaders, you know, guys like Bill Mitchell. I mean, no, Harley Earl was uh, yeah, still Harley there. Harley Earl right? was yeah. just transitioning right. out. He'd been there since 1927. You know, and and, and uh, Bill Mitchell had been his right hand man for 20, 27 years or something like that, or 25 years. No. And I'm going, this guy was working here before I was born. You know? right. Well, the next next project, of course, was uh, Bill Mitchell came into our studio downstairs. Now, the studio I'm working in is a place called Research B, and it's kind of a place where they put the the new young designers to kind of see what they can do. It's it's a, an orientation, advanced studio, whatever. And anybody in top management really <coughs> doesn't go down to those areas too much. So it's kind of a quiet place. So at this time, the Corvette project had been killed off by General Motors management. They were getting outsold by the T-Birds, you know, 15 to one. And so they figured the whole Corvette program was just something to get rid of. It's not making any money, get rid of it. So they canceled the entire Corvette program. Bill Mitchell, being an enthusiast, said, I don't think so. You know, I'm going to redo the Corvette the way I want it done because the previous one had been done by Harley Earl and it was, didn't, he didn't like it. He wanted something special. Well, it looked cool, but it didn't really have the yeah, performance. Yeah, right. 
And he, what had happened is that he had gone over the, to the, uh, the Turin Auto Show in, uh, in the summer of, uh, of uh, 56, 57, and he'd seen all of these really neat little cars that all had kind of a little aerodynamic shape with little aerodynamic shapes over each wheel and stuff. And the one that really impressed him the most was the Alfa Romeo Disco Volante, because what he wanted to do is he wanted to build a Corvette coupe. He knew that one of the problems with the Corvette is that people didn't like the weather yeah. problem, with, and especially in Detroit. Uh, he came in, walks into the studio, and I mean, we were all, there's only four of us in there, you know, uh, young designers. And of course we knew him instantly who he was. And he's a very gregarious guy, totally different than Harley Earl, who never talked to anybody. He says, fellas, come over here and sit down here. I want to show you something. So he said, you know, I, it, that he had gone over the Turin show and he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out a whole bunch of photographs and says, look at these. And we didn't know what he was going to talk about at all. And he, you know, finally got, you know, as we're looking at these going, God, this is really cool looking stuff. And he says, well, as you know, the Corvette program has been canceled and we're all going, yeah, it's one of the losses. We all want to work on Corvettes. And he says, well, we're, we're not going to kill the Corvette program off. We're going to build our own Corvette, and you guys are going to do it. And we're kind of looking at each other because, like, maybe he's telling every other studio that they're going to have their little project. But they couldn't do that because management had killed the thing off, and the only place that he could do it was down in this advanced studio. Uh, so we had some real talent down there, and he explained what he wanted to do with this theme that he'd seen on all these little... Uh, special aerodynamic record cars in Italy. So he gave us the whole brief of what he wanted the car, the direction to be, and said, you know, take your best work, put it up on the wall, I'll be back in a couple of days and, and see what I, I like, you know. So we all got down busy and put kind of stuff all over the walls and Bill comes back in a couple of days later and, and walks slowly around the whole room, you know, and walks back to one drawing on the wall. He says, uh, who did that? I said, oh, I, raised my hand. He says, okay, this thing looks more like what I want to go, what direction I want to go. Now your job to do, and he pointed to everybody else, is do something better than this car. Okay, so so it's a competition among all, all four of us in there. So he says, I'll be back in a week, and you know where we're going. So he comes back in a week later, and walks around again, and picks another thing off the wall and says, who did that? I raised my hand again. <laughs> he says, okay. A lot of that, pressure. I, I mean, it was just amazing. You know, first of all, the, the, the honor that he looked at. I mean, these, every guy in there was really good. And uh, so, but it, it really reflected, I was able to pick up the nuances that he wanted to see in the car. And from that car, that drawing that they did in, in November of 57, that car didn't come on the market until '63. Yeah, but it's that same car. I mean, yeah. you can pick. Oh, it I've up. seen. That's I've it. seen the draw. I've seen God. your drawings and the yeah, car. That's all a, right. So after you saved the Corvette, yeah, right. I mean, the guy. I'm here with the guy that saved the Corvette. Uh, so how did you transition <coughs> over to Shelby? Well, the main thing was, <laughs> I still oh. wanted to be a race driver. And you didn't want to live in Detroit either. And did you? I didn't want to live in Detroit. <laughs> So I had a, a Volkswagen bus and a little trailer, and I packed the whole thing up, and I'm going to go back to California and get into racing. And when I got back there, I went to my first race out at uh, Palm Springs, and uh, the guy that pulls into the pit next to me, he pulls into this big, big yellow car that's, you know, making all kinds of noise and stuff. And I didn't know who it was at the time, but it's Max Balchowski. Yeah, I was going to say, that was old Yeller. Yeah, it's old Yeller. And, and Max never had a trailer. The whole time yeah. he drove his cars to the races, raced them and drove them home. So he, you know, and driving into the pits, he just found a spot to pull in next to me, and that's where he's going to pit. And it I'm changed having, your life again. <laughs> I'm having a little problem with something, and he walks over and says, what are you doing there? And I said, well, I'm having a problem with this throttle thing. So he reaches over and fixes it. You know, what a neat guy, you know. Yeah. So, you know, so I started hanging around watching this guy. It's well, really going good. going from one legend to another. God, <laughs> you know, so it turns out, he says, well, I need some help uh, chasing parts and stuff during the day. Do you want to do that? And I said, boy, do I. So we made a deal, you know. I'd chase parts for him or do whatever in the, to clean up the shop during the day. 
and at night he'd help me on my race car. So at the same time, this is now 1959, Carroll Shelby is at the peak of his career, yeah. has just won Le Mans yeah. with Roy Salvadori. He wants to Aston come back Martin, in. Yeah. yeah. And in, for the 60 season, he wants to close out his career running a couple of races. So he comes to Max because that's the, the, the hottest car really in Southern California. Yeah, he beat all the yeah. big dollar cars. Yeah, I mean, there's Paravano out there with all the latest Ferraris and Maseratis and, and Bill Edgar. And, I mean, guys rolling and in really the big trailers <laughs> and stuff. And, you know, and Max's whole thing was really just to kind of puncture that social balloon with this big ugly car and go out and smoke them. And there was so much great basic engineering. I mean, he really was a mentor in my life and taught me so much. Uh, and he says, you know, nothing's real until you learn it and do it yourself. So just try it all because everybody's trying to tell you what something is. And he says, they don't know any more than you do. They just think they do or they read it in a magazine someplace. So hanging around Max was a, a great education. And here comes Shelby. He's uh, looking for a ride. So he makes a deal with Max to drive the old yeller in a couple of races. You know, I dro drove it at Elkhart Lake and whatever, and uh, did well. At so during this time, you know, Shelby's coming in all the time, and I'm getting to know him. And the other guy that's coming in is a guy named Paul O'Shea, who was just like John Fitch. He was the factory U.S. Mercedes factory pilot. So Shelby was was the winner of Le Mans, but O'Shea was the top guy in the United States because he was a full-time paid driver for Mercedes. So he's at the sort of the peak of his career and here's Shelby thinking. That, so they start talking about doing this driving school and I'm listening to what's going on and you know, but the thing is is that Shelby's thinking that O'Shea's going to work for him and O'Shea's thinking Carol's going to work for him. So Two big egos. Yeah. <laughs> So they decide that they're gonna go out to the track and, and inspect Riverside Raceway and see if, what they can do in garages and set the whole thing up on it. So I ride out there with, with Carol and of course O'Shea goes out in his own car and stuff. And when they get there, they obviously believe that neither is gonna work for the other guy. And O'Shea just says, well, I'm out of here on this. I don't wanna have any part of it. He gets his car and leaves. And Carol looks down, he says, well, I really haven't got any time to run this whole thing. Do you want to run the school? And I said, yeah. I'm going to get to drive race cars every day at, at Riverside, point. you yeah. know. How good is that? But I only had like seven races on my logbook at that time. But the good thing that came in at the same time <laughs> is that Carol hired Ken Miles. Yeah. So Ken Miles was going to do the development on our cars. So he's coming out every day or two, you know, with the Cobras. And I get to sit in the seat next to him, and Ken teaches me how to drive a race car. Wow. <laughs> and then I take that and use that for my, my curriculum for the school because he has a great way of explaining things. So I use that same thing in teaching him, and that became the, the Carroll Shelby School of High Performance Driving, but it should have been the Ken Miles School because he taught me everything. That so I after the first year, this is 1963, the Cobras win the United States Road Racing Championship, the first professional series for the SECA. This is a transitional period in history for American racing, because road racing. Because up until this period, everything had been amateur. Yeah. But all these guys in Southern California are all pros, and they don't want to belong to this club in Connecticut, you know, that can't be paid. So they form the California Sports Cup Club, and they start promoting their own races, and they've got you know, the LA Times behind them, and they, yep. they do the, the Times Mirror Grand Prix, and all of a sudden, racing becomes, road racing becomes professional. And who's really going fast? Shelby. So he's already bought Coopers, he's putting his 289 Cobra yep. engines in them, he's put Dave McDonald in them, and we win the first Times Mirror Grand Prix. So, I mean, this is an incredible two-year change from 63, yeah. totally changed American racing. You were right in the middle of it, that's right so cool. Right in the middle of watching this whole thing. So now Carol sees, you know, there's a lot bigger world out there. Let's go back to Europe and race against Ferrari, you know. I mean, he understands what a great thing this could be to go back to race against the greatest name. Because he's been there, he's run several years in Europe, he's won Le Mans, he knows how big a deal it is. So he starts talking to this about it to the crew 
And the, all the guys in Shelby are going, there's no way we want to go to Europe. We want him to build an Indianapolis car. <laughs> That's what racing's all about yeah. for them. <laughs> so there is a lot of resistance about going to Europe, you know. But anyway, he's focused on doing this. So we knew, you know, from American racing on two and a half mile tracks, there's nothing that's going to touch a Cobra. I mean, it's the best power to weight ratio, whatever. But the thing only has a top speed of 160 miles an hour. So the, the Ferraris at that point had been introduced one year before the GTOs, and they're doing 180 miles an hour. So, you know, I went to Carroll and said, you know, I, I've got a little knowledge on aero work because I know what the Germans have done. I said, I can design a car for you that will compete with them. And under the rules, we can put a new body on the, on the Cobra. So he got pretty excited about that at first, you know. So then he started talking to the rest of the guys in the shop about it, and they're going, are you kidding? Yeah, Remington was against it, right? Completely. <laughs> and it's not because he was, you know, so much against it. He, did, he had gone to Europe with Lance Reventlow, totally with that form, yeah. front engine Formula yeah, One car. Yeah, and stuff. You know, the car didn't work. He didn't like the people, couldn't speak the language, thought the French were screwed up. <laughs> and the other thing that I didn't really know about at the time, he had been asked to go to look with for Ford for what might be a new car that Ford might run. So he had gone to see the new Lola Mark VI. So he came back with all the information that, you know, Ford was going to be introducing this new car, it's mid-engine, all the best ideas, and the idea of running that car against a car that was basically designed in 1939, which is a yeah. Cobra. He advised Carroll, it's a bad idea. Now here's the smartest race car builder in Southern California telling Carroll that this kid thinks he can build a car that's going to be better, is not going to work. So Carroll says, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> The thing that really turned that around was Ken Miles came in and talked to Carol quietly and he said, I know what the Germans were doing in there and what Pete is telling is the right stuff. He says, it's not going to cost you anything to let him draw that whole car up and make a presentation. And Carol said, okay, so he's got Ken Miles on one side and Remington on the other and they're <laughs> like this. So I make this whole presentation up and draw the car up and present it to the whole guys in the shop. And there's absolute silence, you know. I mean, they're all following Remington, who's their boss. And so, Carol goes, what are we gonna do on that side? I said, have we got a money to build? He says, there's no money to build a car. He says, do you still think it's gonna work? And I said, yeah. So, he says, okay. He says, I got uh, Ted Lobinger and uh, Webner coming out here, Tony Webner, Larry. And uh, th these are the guys that are running the Goodyear racing program because he was the distributor for the 11 Western States. So he comes down and he says, draw me a picture of what the car is going to look like. And I'd never done any, you know, pretty drawings or anything like that. I'd all done the engineering on it. You know, my presentation had been four views like engineering, like the guys could understand. Yeah. So when I drew the car up and every, with a chopped off tail and the weird roof line and everything, everybody was like, yeah, it was, no today way. it's the legendary design, yeah, but right. back then it was funny looking. It, it, <laughs> it, nobody wanted any part of it at yeah. all except Ken Miles. It was Ken that really made the decision on it. So when the guys came out from Goodyear, he showed them the sketch, and they realized that if, if Shelby came out with a new trick-looking car and had Goodyear tires on it, that would make a big, big impression. So they put up the bucks to build the car. It oh, well, wasn't much. I never heard that story. Yeah, That's cool. so it wasn't Ford. We couldn't go to Ford Motor Company. They had just bought the GT40 right, right. on the they Lola. Were, they were heading a di different direction. So there and was no money to be had were, from Ford. You weren't really that involved in the Ford GT Not at, at all. That point. We were this way against Ford yeah. GT. All right. So all the guys in the shop are hearing about this great car from Ford. They're all going to want to work on it. It's millions of dollars, and they're all going to be looking. And <laughs> so... The Ford GT was built by John Olson, who was our young crew chief that came in from New Zealand, who was not part of the California this is the, group of guys. The Cobra Coupe? The Cobra yeah, Coupe, okay. yeah. So to build that car, John Olson, who was kind of a, a great fabricator, builder, everything, took on the job of being the crew chief on it. And because he wasn't one of the favored 
California guys at Remington liked said, you go work while they're with Brock over there. <laughs> and then Miles came in, you know, hands on and myself. And uh, so we started, you know, putting the whole thing together. Yeah, I've seen pictures of the wooden box and stretching the aluminum yeah. over it and stuff. So I drew, I had drawn the whole thing up in quarter scale <clears throat> and then took all the patterns and the section lines on them. And it, it, if I'd done it like they do in General Motors, it would have taken a month to draw this whole thing up. So what I did is I took a 35 millimeter camera and photographed each one of the sections on it and blew it up on the wall. And I knew what the height was and what the width was and just focused it on that and drew that up. And that's what we made that wooden buck wow. on. So in, in drawing this whole car up, uh, the traditional way race cars were built at that time is that all the aluminum panels were stamped out in a shop down in, in Los Angeles called Calmetto Shaping. Every Indy car, you know, whether you were building a Kuzma or the Curtis or whatever, everybody built their race car body, all the aluminum panels rough down to Calmetto shape. So we took our wooden buck down there and they, they made all the panels on it and then we brought it back and that's where we actually built the car. You adapted it to a Cobra coupe and, chassis. And, and under the rules, you could change the chassis or you could change the body, but you couldn't do both. So basically underneath, it's an exact copy of the car that we'd won the, the United States Road Racing Championship in, in 63. All we did was put a new body on it. So everybody in the shop is still like, um, I don't know, they're wasting their time or whatever on it. So very few people were really interested in what happened the first day we went out, which was February 1st, I remember the day, you know, in 1963, or uh, 64. Sure, yeah. yeah. Miles was driving. Miles, Miles took the car out, and uh, I mean, this is a standard Cobra chassis underneath, and we'd done nothing but put new body on it. And Miles goes out in the car, and doesn't take more than a couple laps on it. And we haven't changed tire pressures. We haven't done anything else. And he comes back and he says, "What gear have we got in this thing?" And he says, "Was well, identical to the Roadsters." Okay. So. He didn't even believe it. He had to jack the car up, and we turned the wheel and counted the yeah. amount of turns on the on the drive shaft. Because <laughs> he's like and, 20 miles an hour yeah, faster, and right? he's coming out of the corners, and I mean, he's got so many miles and on that track, he knows every bush yeah. out there, and he knows how many RPM he's got yeah. here. <laughs> and you know, and the car is going 180 miles an hour down the chute. Yeah, it's a, I've, I got to race there once. It's a fast track. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't even finish up. He says. Christ, we need more rubber on the back end. And he goes and he calls Shelby and he says, call Goodyear, we've got to get some new tires on the back end. This, thing's, this thing will beat the Ferraris right now. So no. Shelby <laughs> calls back to Goodyear and they said, we, I mean, Daytona's like, you know, four weeks away. And they said, we can't build you a new tire in four weeks. He says, but we have a new front stock car type or tire that's that diameter, but it's a little wider. So they flew them out and we put them on the car the next day and they stuck out about this much more beyond the body. So we put a lot of little spats on the outside and that's the way we went to Daytona and the thing was just, it was a rocket ship. Yeah. But the interesting thing was that Carol would not let Ken drive the car, which was, we're all going, this is Ken's car. We built it around him and Carol would not let him drive. He says, no, you're too valuable or whatever. We're going to make you the team manager. Wow. So we got two guys that have never driven the car, Bob Holbert and Dave McDonald. Yeah. Both top drivers had been driving our Cobras. Holbert gets out on the car. He comes back in after, you know, half a dozen laps. And he says, this is no contest. He says, I can go past the Ferraris with no problem at all. He says, why don't we just back the RPM down on it a little bit and we'll keep the engine all right. We know we can you know, yeah. win the race. So we did that twice. Each time we backed it down 500 RPM. So now we're, we're running the same time as the Ferraris. So we did our mileage test and I think we were 24% better mileage than we got on the Roadsters wow. <laughs> with the body alone. Yeah. And we've gone from 160 mile an hour to 190 mile an hour car yeah. now. So this had to be kind of a I told you so moment. Yeah. So, you know, finally everybody's getting the picture, you know, and so we run the car. We're leading by seven, seven laps and we come in. Uh, Holbert comes in. He says, I smell a lot of smoke in the cockpit. Something's wrong. So our guys knew immediately what it was. We're losing the seals on the rear differential. 
So all this grease is pouring out of the back end on it. So they're going, we know what this it is. This is a we'll, Salisbury unit in that car, yeah, I think, right. right? Yeah, So we know what to fix on it. We can get it fixed right away. So, and the guys are going, well, we don't have the grease here. Let's put some 50 weight in it and send them out and run again, you know. So in the meantime, while they're doing that, they, they refuel the car completely. And then they find the grease and come back in. So they give him the end sing and he comes back in. And they're going to dive, you know, uh, dive underneath the car and, and start working on it. And Carol's yelling, refuel the car, refuel the car. And they're going, Carol, we've refueled the car. It's full of fuel. I don't care. God damn it. I said fuel the car. So they pour the fuel in. Of course, there's two openers in it. And it comes out. It comes out on the brakes. And the whole car yep. goes into flame. Yeah, that's a and legendary that was the end picture. Of it. That was the yep. end of it. Yeah. So, so we, uh, we lost that race, and consequently, because all of our guys, Charlie Agapu, primarily a crew chief on the car with, with, uh, with uh, John, uh, John Olson, they said, we can have this thing running because it burned the wiring and, and we can put a new diff in it. And even if we go out and we're, you know, third place for a bit, we can catch the Ferraris up and beat them. And it doesn't even matter. We'll still get some points for second or third place. And Carol was so pissed. He said, no, we're done. And they're going, Carol, we can do it. No, we're done. And that was it. That was it, huh? And at the end of the season, we didn't have the points, and we lost the championship. That's right, yep. So that's uh, the end of the Daytona story. Well, right. uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm interviewing <laughs> one of the most magnificent careers ever. This is going to so. take a little more time. I think we're going to do part two. All right. Uh, we need to talk about the Hino years, okay. BRE, of course, yeah. uh, your hang gliding, your journalism career, your photography. All right. So yeah. if you like this sort of stuff, please like us and click subscribe and go to our website, classicmotorsports.com. Support brands that support classic motorsports. Get your chemical solutions from CRC Industries. Visit crcindustries.com to learn more.